Last week we looked at a parable that has confused interpreters for centuries, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And I took a stab at clearing it up, or at least making it less confusing. And you can be the judge at how well I did. This week, however, we're going to look at a parable that has vexed interpreters even more than the parable of the laborers. One commentator said of the variety of curious and even odd interpretations that many of the interpreters had overrun their game. In other words, they had continued the chase long after the quarry had stopped running. Another said that the lack of knowledge about this parable is in inverse proportion to the amount written about it. Rarely has so much been said with so little light shed. So I'm talking about the parable of the unjust steward, which is so daunting that I thought about tackling it a few weeks ago and then decided that the parable of the laborers in the vineyard would be easier by comparison. So let's take a look at the parable and I'll see if I can do more than just simply add words with little enlightenment. The parable is found in Luke chapter 16 verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So, you see what I'm talking about? People have been trying for years to come up with a, a positive moral message to, out, to take out of this parable. This parable that is made up of immoral and dishonest people doing immoral and dishonest things. So, here are some of the suggestions that have been put forth over the years. One of the earliest explanations is that the parable is about giving alms. Give to help out poor people. Now, that's a good message. And almsgiving was important then, just as charitable giving is important now. But this isn't about almsgiving. The manager wasn't giving alms to the poor people from his own money. He was cheating his boss out of money in order to curry favor when he was out of a job. And he wasn't concerned about any poor people. He was concerned about himself. The, the most prevalent interpretation is that it's the manager's wisdom that is being praised, not his dishonesty. The King James reflects this interpretation, rendering verse 8 as, And the Lord, master, not God, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. But Greek had plenty of words to indicate wisdom, most notably Sophia. But that's not the word used here. Pretty much all the English translations use shrewdly, and being shrewd is different than being wise. Wisdom has no bad connotations, but 
shrewd kind of has an edge. It's, it's worldly knowledge that gives an advantage, often at the cost of moral compromise. In other words, it's, it's acting just like this unjust manager. Another interpretation is that the manager is not unjust or dishonest at all. All he's done is canceled the interest on the debts, which was illegal for Jews to charge each other. But it's Jesus himself that calls the manager dishonest, so you can't just say that he's not really dishonest. And there are even some who say that the dishonest manager depicts Jesus, whom the Pharisees and other religious leaders see as squandering the religious tradition handed down to him. And Jesus cancels the debts of sinners. But the manager doesn't dismiss the debts. He merely reduces them. And on and on and on I could go. One scholar listed 16 different takes on the parable, saying that, these were only the most representative of the bewildering number of interpretations that are out there. Like I said, no one really knows what is going on here. I think one thing is actually clear, and that is that no one is a good guy in this parable. Similar to last week where I said it was a mistake to associate the vineyard owner with God, that's even more true here with the rich man. Remember, this is Luke who of all the gospel writers is an advocate for the poor. He's got nothing good to say about a rich person. Immediately after this parable, he has the, the story of the rich man and the poor beggar Lazarus, and the rich man goes to Hades. The closest Luke comes to saying anything positive about wealthy people is in the parable of the prodigal son. But while the father is clearly wealthy, Luke makes sure that he doesn't call him a rich man. He's simply a man with two sons. But let's be clear. In the ancient Near East, the way a person became wealthy, pretty much without question, was through dishonesty and corruption. It wasn't a pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of hard work thing. It was by colluding with the government and the temple to exploit the poor, by making loans at loan shark interest rates, and then seizing the poor man's land while throwing him in debtor's prison. So we need to be clear about this. While we tend to idolize rich people and give them benefits they don't actually need, Luke is more clear-eyed about the uber-rich. In his eyes, they're essentially money hoarders. Ever watched any of those hoarding shows? It's, it's sad. People who, who collect stuff that they just can't get rid of. They don't need any of it, but they keep getting more. And the problem is they can't afford to put it anywhere. A person who hoards money doesn't need it either, but unlike a regular hoarder, they can always build bigger barns to put their excess in, or buy bigger yachts, or rocket ships, so whatever. I mean, it, it actually looks respectable, attractive even, but still hoarding. So that's the rich guy. He's excessively rich. The, the amounts he's owed are obscene. The amount of oil that he's, he's owed is three years' worth of a laborer's earnings. A hundred cores of wheat, which is what the Greek says, is equal to seven and a half years of a laborer's earnings. The common person doesn't get into that kind of debt by missing a few payments. He's the victim of usury in the worst kind. The unjust manager, well, He's unjust and dishonest. He's not even a Robin Hood type character robbing the rich to give to the poor. He's robbing the rich to save his own hide. I, I think that there are two keys to understanding this parable. The first is in something that isn't said, and the second in something that is. Let's take a look at what's not said first. Jesus does not say the kingdom of God is like in many of his parables, Jesus introduces them in this way. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of God is like a merchant who discovers a pearl of great value. And even when Jesus doesn't introduce a parable like this, it's clearly implied. So, it's understandable that we assume that it's implied here and then spend our time trying to figure out how the kingdom of God is like anything in this parable. And I think that's a mistake. I don't think Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God in this parable. I think he's 
contrasting the kingdom of God to the world of this parable. And that's where the second key comes in, the one that is said. It's verse 13. No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. There's no straddling between two worlds, Jesus says, between the world that revolves around God and the world that revolves around wealth, or mammon, as some translations render. The two operate in two completely different and opposite ways, each with their own set of rules that are mutually exclusive. The world of mammon, Jesus says, operates out of greed and self-interest. Cooperation exists only as it profits all parties equally, and when it ceases to do so, cooperation ceases, often messily so. If in a partnership one party can take advantage of the other's weakness, they do so ruthlessly, without hesitation or remorse. You only trust as far as you can verify, and if you can't verify, you don't trust. In fact, if trust requires verification, It's not trust, just the opposite. In the world of mammon, it's dog-eat-dog survival of the fittest and only the strong survive. If you're stronger than someone else, you use that strength to leverage them to your advantage. And if you aren't as strong as others, well, you use your wits to survive using whatever means. In other words, you're shrewd. This is is the game, and this is how it works. If you're going to play the game and play to win, then these are the rules you have to play. And it doesn't make any sense to play the game if you aren't going to play to win. The rich man praises his unjust, soon-to-be former manager because he was shrewd and took advantage of his position as steward to cheat his soon-to-be former boss. It wasn't revenge. It was self-preservation, and because he didn't want to do any hard work like digging ditches and had too much pride to beg. That he got to cheat his boss in doing so was just an added bonus. And understand, his boss didn't like getting cheated any more than the next guy, but he admires the manager for playing the game Well, he did what the rich man would have done in the same situation, probably what the rich man had done already to competitors along the way to becoming a rich man. Doesn't mean that the rich man won't try to do anything to get his manager back, because that's not how the game is played either. But he's already fired him, so he's lost some leverage. There may be nothing that he can do to the manager, which is part of the shrewdness of the plan. Baseball has rules, but perhaps more than any other sport, baseball is famous for its unwritten rules. For instance, if a batter hits a home run, he's supposed to put his bat down and run around the bases at a reasonable trot. He's not supposed to fling the bat or take a slow stroll around the bases like he's doing a victory lap. That's that's considered showing up the pitcher and disrespecting the game. And everybody knows that if you do that, the next time up, you can expect a fastball in the ear, even if it's a different pitcher. It used to be that if a player showed a pitcher up, His own teammates would jump his case, and they wouldn't react when the pitch came at his ear. And everybody understood the rules of the game. And there are other unwritten rules. Like, if you hit one of our guys, the next inning, we're going to hit one of yours. If it was unintentional, it'll be a slow curveball in the back. If it was intentional, it'll be a fastball in the back, but always in the back. Retaliatory pitchers are never at the head unless the first pitch was at the head. These are among the unwritten rules that the veterans teach the young players and expect them to to abide by. And you may think that they're stupid, and they kind of are. And you may think that they're dangerous, and they definitely are. But if you want to play the game, you have to play by all the rules, the written rules, and the unwritten rules. And if you won't play by the unwritten rules, not only will you lose, you'll be ostracized by your own teammates. Jesus is warning his followers that you can't play the God game and the mammon game 
at the same time. The rules are different. They exclude each other. So when Jesus says, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes, he's talking to the children of light who think that they can be followers of Jesus while trying to win the mammon game. And you can't. Because playing the mammon game means acting like this unjust manager or his rich employer. If you try to play the mammon game, but don't play it shrewdly, you're essentially playing to lose. And who does that? And if you think that God will be pleased with you for playing the mammon game honestly, justly, fairly, you're wrong. Because just playing the game means that you've forsaken the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and you're going to lose. So, if you're going to play the mammon game, Jesus says, at least play to win, so that you can make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, in other words, when you lose, as you inevitably will, that they may welcome you into the eternal homes. And you better hope that they will, because you will have excluded yourself from God's eternal home. You can't serve two masters. To serve one is to hate the other. You can't serve God and mammon because you won't be any good at serving either. Like I said, immediately after this parable, Jesus tells another one about a guy who won the mammon game. And ended up in Hades, realizing that some games can't be won. That even if you end up winning the mammon game, that just makes you the biggest loser of a losing game. Every decision you make excludes many other options. If you decide to get married, it means you're faithful to one person and only one person. If you decide to have children, it means you can't spend all your evenings and weekends pursuing your own hobbies or passions. And those that think that they can, that think that they can find balance, end up being unmarried or with children who resent them because they barely know them, or both. Every decision precludes other choices. So, choose wisely. Following Jesus is not easy. It demands 100% commitment and maximum effort. But it's the only way that prepares you to live fully in the kingdom of God. It's the only way that leads to life. Father, as your children, we need to regularly examine our hearts to see if there are things, pursuits, or attitudes that are drawing us away from your heart and thrusting us once again into the mindset of the world. Rid us of any double-mindedness. Refresh our spirit. Renew our minds. Father, since you know our hearts more than we do ourselves, reveal to us that which helps and that which hinders our Christian walk. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. You don't hover over us in judgment, but you walk alongside of us, assuring us of your unwavering love and boundless mercy that will see us through on this side of the journey. We walk this journey step by step, guided by your Spirit, and holding fast to the example of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.